The, um, it's my pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Ruth Halban to give the talk about uh, the, the ways in which we conduct research in melanoma and what we're looking for. For those of you that don't know, Dr. Halban has been studying the biology of melanoma for a very, very long time. Very long time. <laughs> but, but, and, and, and she is recognized as really one of the world's, maybe the world's expert on the biology of melanoma. She's made many important contributions to the field. Most recently, she was one of the first, perhaps the first, to sequence multiple melanoma cell lines and identify new mutations in melanoma that had never been seen before, some of which may lead to new therapies for this disease. So with, with that, uh, by the way, Dr. Ru Dr. Halban is also the director of a major grant that we have from the National Cancer Institute to study the biology of melanoma, the SPORE program. Dr. Halban, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so until now, let me see, make sure that you hear me. Until now, you really heard about everything that you can see uh, in melanoma. Uh, so now you have to shift your brain a little bit and think about the melanoma, the cells, the individual cells, and what's going on inside the cells, because this is what the research is, is all about. Uh, what I particularly uh, will focus is really the, the framework of melanoma research, basic research and applied research is uh, what is known in Yale as the Yale spore in skin cancer. Because we have this program going on for about uh, eight years. Uh, and before that, there were maybe about three investigators working in melanoma. Right now, there are many more due to this program and the fund uh, that the NCI gave, and I'll mention also others. So, Essentially, what is that that we want to know about melanoma? Uh, obviously, we want to understand the mechanism by which normal melanocytes become malignant. Uh, you heard about the melanocytes, the melanocytes in the skin, the melanocytes in diff different parts of your body. They are normal. They don't do anything bad except for providing you protection from sunlight. So how come they become transformed? Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we want to assess UV exposure. You also heard about the role of UV uh, in melanoma and melanoma risk. So uh, we want to study that too. Uh, the melanoma and the tumors really interact with the microenvironment, with the stoma, with the niche in which they start growing. And there is going on and off uh, essentially communication between the tumor and the niche, and we want to understand that too. And part of that, an important part of this microenvironment, is really the immune response. Uh, the PD-1 and the anti-CD LA4 antibodies, they are all really targeting the environment in which the tumor uh, grow. Uh, as Mario already mentioned we want to uh, identify new molecular and immunological targets for therapy. Uh, we want, and once the melanoma is there and once you are getting treatment, treatment we want to know why in some cases uh, the cells just disappear and go away and in some cases they remain and come back. And uh, so we want to understand the sensitivity and the resistance to drug and the treatment. And at the same time, we want also to discover biomarkers. Biomarkers for sun sensitivity, for disease burden, prognosis, and so on. So uh, I want to just uh, describe a little bit the Yale Spore in Skin Cancer. Essentially, it's composed of four major projects. I'm sure you heard a lot about uh, NCI funding, NIH funding, and so on. Each one of these uh, projects is essentially the magnitude or the size, the size of an NIH uh, project. Uh, we have also three core facilities, very important. Uh, the administration, obviously, somebody has to administrate the place, but more importantly is the tissue resource and the bioinformatics, which I will uh, describe a little bit more. 
We have, so in addition to the four major projects that in a way are set as we apply or as we start this poll, we have also what uh, is called Developmental Research Project, which uh, we fund uh, individual scientists uh, for one or two years with less amount of money, something like 50000 So if somebody at Yale has an idea in which he, can, he or she can apply to melanoma, we have the funds for that. So we constantly renew and uh, essentially develop new projects. And we have some educational activity, outreach for, patient, for a patient advocate. We have actually three patient advocates uh, on our sport. So I talked about the tissue resource uh, core. So this is very important because it actually relates to you. Uh, we collect from the wonderful uh, surgeons that you held uh, until now, from the clinician, uh, essentially, any melanoma patient that come to Yale uh, and the tumor is resected, we get the tissue immediately. Not only that, we get blood cells, we, we get blood, which we process. Very frequently, we get also skin. So, altogether, for the past, let's say, eight years, we have about 12,000 specimen that are stored in our, in, in our uh, bank. And these specimens are not only for us, we actually share it with other institutes, with other investigators. A lot of it has to do with immunology and what's the response of the cells that we share this um, specimen with. Uh, also, it sh I should mention that um, I, I am in the dermatology department. But essentially, the Yale SPO is composed of 13 different departments. And we have the best of the best of Yale. Uh, some of the investigators are chairman of, um, like we have the chairman of the pharmacology department, uh, the chairman of the radiation therapy department, part of the, part of the SPO. OK, so why we want to think about melanoma in a more uh, molecular way. Well, for one, I should just mention right away, we heard already about BRAF. We heard about BRAF therapy, and that came out from basic research. You know, BRAF mutation was identified in 40% of melanoma, and immediately uh, the thinking was, we have to target that. So. Um, and that also uh, brought to the attention molecular changes in cancer. And recently, as Mari also indicated, there, were, there are a lot of uh, cancers that have been sequenced. So the DNA of the cancer is being subjected to what is called deep sequencing to find changes in the DNA. And that has been done in several cancers, as you see in this chart. And the experience so far, if you plot the number of somatic mutation per tumor with various cancer, you can see that melanoma is very up, is at the top. Essentially, and I'll show you again, one of the characteristics of melanoma is that there are a lot of changes in the DNA that leads either to single mutation, like the same kind of uh, of DNA reads that will decide whether you have blue eyes or, 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 or dark eyes. The same thing is with melanoma. So already mentioned before, and I'll just go very fast, uh, the melanoma, it's thought that I would say two types of mutations that are considered driver mutation in a cancer. One type of mutation, like the BRAS, BRAF, NRAS, and the GNA1Q are kind of mutation that make the protein more active. And therefore, it actually provides advantage to the cells. They proliferate better. They go from one place. They migrate from one place to another. Uh, the kit mutation is also of that kind. And then there are mutations, like BAP1, for example, that actually it's a tumor suppressor that lost its activity. So there is what is called loss of function. So there is the gain of function mutation and the loss of function mutation that are essentially in unbalance in cancer and in melanoma. 
So we are back into, uh, I would just like to mention one more thing. Uh, having a BRF mutation does not make normal cells malignant. So NRAS, you know, I have melanocytes in my, in my laboratory that we put the BRF mutation into them, they still remain normal. The same is with the NRAS and the same is with all the other mutations. So a single mutation will not cause malignant transformation. You need other changes. And the other changes, this is what we thought, we, this is what we look for when we did the very deep sequencing of melanoma tumors. So essentially, uh, right now we have about 300 melanomas that have been sequenced. And the main reason we could do it here, not, not every institute can do it, is because we had the community due to the spore. We had the surgeons, the oncologists, the pathologists, the bioinformatics, and the basic research to do all this. We have the specimen resource, resource core, as I indicated. We have, right now we have 800 melanoma and tumor cells in my freezer. And on top of that, we had also, <laughs> we had also normal cells. We had also normal blood cells. So the, the, the key element in finding out changes in melanoma is to have also the normal DNA. Because look, look in the crowd here. Everybody is different. So when you sequence the DNA, you don't know whether this difference is inherited and has nothing to do with, with the melanoma or the cancer, or whether it is acquired, what we call somatic. It's only in the tumor and not in the normal DNA. So that's very critical. And we have the bioinformatics, so you can imagine how much information is gained from all this sequencing, and you need a bioinformatic core to deal with this, and funds from various sources. So this is an example of one of the results from the uh, exome sequencing or DNA sequencing. What you see here are individual tumors. Each one of these bars is an individual uh, tumor. And the way they were plotted is a number, according to the number of mutations per tumor. So this is 3,500 mutations in that particular tumor. And so it falls down. Now, what is characteristic here, so this peak of melanoma that have very high number of mutation, what's characteristic for them is one, they are actually don't have BRAF mutation. They are free of any BRAF mutation. Two, they belong, they essentially came from older patients, from a melanoma that was in the head or neck, and from patients that were uh, essentially experienced chronic sand damage. So, that already tells you, and I'll show you again uh, another uh, evidence, that all the talk about UV light is for real. The changes are induced in the melanoma, in the melanoma cells, as you expose yourself to UV light. Uh, what you see here are all those orange are the sun-exposed melanoma. Some of them is the unknown. Sometimes we have melanoma that are unknown. And all here, the light orange color, those are the sun-shielded melanoma. And in fact, in the sun-shielded melanoma, as indicated to you, whether it's in the eye, in the mouth, in the ecran, there are very few mutations. You know, one of the top one is only 30 mutations, and some of them might have even two or three. And the driving force may not be a single mutation, what I'm talking about, a single uh, mutation, but rather in other gross changes in the DNA. Now this is uh, when UV light hits DNA, it makes a change, a base, a base pair change. And I'm not going to elaborate, but it's called UV signature. Actually, it was found by uh, Doug Brush at Yale, who is one of the uh, sport, uh, sport instruct, uh, uh, investigator. So, what you see, it, it's called dipyrimidine, and it's induced by UV light. It's a sin signature in melanoma from the skin and in melanoma from acral mucosal or uveal non-sun shielded. So here you see equal amount of either this or this in the sun shielded 
and a large peak, peak a, UP, a huge peak of this UV signature mutation in the sun-exposed melanoma. So I indicated that melanomas have a lot of mutations, some of them thousands. So what do we do with that? There has to be a way now, um, intellectually, by informatically, analytically, to determine which of these changes are really drivers. And when I talk about drivers, I mean, again, two things. One, that a change in the protein will make this more active, whether it's an enzyme, usually it's an enzyme or a receptor, or a change in the, in the, in the protein that will inactivate it, and this particular protein is your breaker. So you can think, usually people like uh, to have uh, a car uh, as an example. You have the accelerator and you have the breaker. And if both of them break, then you are out of control. So this, this is what I call driver genes. <coughs> then once we identify, uh, not all driver genes are necessarily uh, genes that are involved in, in drug resistance. There are specific, you can think about drug resistance as a process that you want, uh, or let's put it another way, you think about the drug as a process to kill the cells. When it's a BRAF inhibitor, you want to inhibit this BRAF kinase, the enzymatic activity of the uh, enzyme. And yet, very frequently, actually, this treatment doesn't last. So there is what is called drug-resistant <coughs> development. And we want to understand that. What caused drug resistance? Uh, we want to understand genes that are involved in the immune response. You heard here that melanoma is highly immunogenic, immunogenic disease that's now being harnessed for treatment. But all this immunogenic response is part, in a way, of the changes that the cells acquire, that the body recognizes that here there is something new appearing, and in some cases try to fight it, but in some cases also fail to do that. So we are interested in that, and um, in fact, uh, at the NIH, uh, you might have heard about Steve Rosenberg, there is a whole program that we want to emulate here, that patient tumors is being immediately sequenced to identify the change, the mutation, and then he immediately tried to isolate the till, the, uh, the infiltrating lymphocytes that attack the tumor, propagate them, and give it back to the patients. So these mutations are very important for this kind of process. We want to find new targets for therapy, and we want to find out melanoma susceptibility genes, genes that go from um, in the family. Now, I'll essentially describe two uh, new genes that we identify. Uh, one of them is the RAC P29. It's a gain of function that is in about 5% of melanoma. So, uh, it, Again, what we are talking sometimes, we are talking about mutation, is a mutation that is always in the same position in the protein. <coughs> what is called recurrent. The BRAF and RAS, they are recurrent. They are always in the same place. Uh, and the same is this rac 29 It's a recurrent mutation, gain of function in 5% of melanoma. And the other one is the NF1 gene that I would like to mention a little bit. Uh, which is the breaker, uh, the tumor suppressor, that actually suffers from loss of function, mutation. And this is in 12% of total, total melanoma, but I'll re return to that uh, soon. So just a little bit more about RAC1. Uh, essentially, what, what it's doing. Uh, essentially, if you put these mutant genes in normal melanocytes, it will increase the, prolif the cell proliferation and increase the migration of the cells. It's a UV signature mutation. It has this UV signature mutation. Um, it's most of, in, most of the primary melanoma lesions are in sun-exposed area that carry this mutation are in sun-exposed area. 
and most of the patients also reported excess sun exposure. The mutation is not present in the germline, and it's not present in nevi. Uh, you heard about nevi. By the way, nevi can have the BRAF mutation or the NRAS mutation. Just to show you that having this mutation, this terrible mutation, doesn't make the, the lesion uh, malignant. So what do we think about uh, RAC1 as far as the biology of melanoma? Uh, so, you know, melanoma can arise from normal skin, from individual melanocytes, about 65%, or from nevi. About 25% of melanoma arise from nevi. And the cells start pro to proliferate. And the way we think about the RAC1 is the kind of change that will facilitate the migration of the cells from the epidermis. The epidermis is very, very constrained uh, organ. The cells don't just move, cannot just really move from one place to another easily. But this mutation allows the, the malignant cells to move from one place and to metastasize. Now I'm going to the NF1 gene, to the loss of function gene, to the breaker. And this is very inter interesting. Um, I should also reminisce a little bit, like Mario uh, indicated that I came to you a long time ago, and I sat with Steve Arian on uh, tumor board for at least 20 years, I would say. And one of the things that I always felt is I don't belong there. I'm a basic scientist. What am I you know, talking about? Patient talking about lesion. I don't belong there. But for the past five years, I feel I belong there. You know why? Because Steve Arian asked me, is that melanoma has a BRF mutation? Does it have a tenuous mutation? So the status of the mutation is part of the lingo of clinician and uh, tumor board and evaluation of the patient. So until now, we sort of divided the melanoma into the BRAF mutant, which is a, all these green samples of tumor that you see, all those is a single sa sample. So there, there are about 40%, not 60%, uh, there are 40% of tumors have BRAF mutation. Another 20 to 25 have the NRAS mutation that are these buffs, and you can see how they are mutu mutually exclusive. There is only one here that have an NRAS and a BRAF mutant. And then on this side, where there is no BRAF and no NRAS mutation, you have the NF1 mutation. So the characteristic of the NF1 mutant melanoma is that they are predominantly in BRAF NRAS wild type. They are predominantly in older individuals, and they are mostly in tumors that have very high mutation to begin with. Again, these are the ones that I showed you before that uh, reached 3,500. So it's um, a kind of a mutation that probably happened later uh, in the process of the malignancy. Now, uh, the, the mutation, as I say, is loss of function. And the interesting thing is that actually this protein is uh, a break, uh, is essentially the break for NRAS activity. So uh, NRAS, when it is constitutively active, it does its job, but NRAS is controlled by different protein around it, and one of these is NF1. So when NF1 is lost, lost essentially you get increase in NRAS activity. So uh, what do I think about the near future? The near, so there is a lot of effort that was really um, uh, given to sequencing melanoma. So what are we going to do now with all this information? So what you might hear these days is uh, precision medicine. Right now, we take the tumor as, as if all of them are alike, but in fact the melanomas are different, and we know that also from experience. So how do you further define this melanoma? The idea is, and it's already uh, in some institutes, they are already going on with that, uh, is to identify, let's say, 100 genes that are for routine evaluation of melanoma patients that we know change the biology of the tumor. And then every patient that come to the clinic to take the tumor, 
sequence this 100 gene. I say 100 gene because it is also cheaper. Uh, right now, sequencing the whole exome, what you call the whole coding region of, uh, of a tumor, is about uh, $2,500. Uh, $2, but if we sequence 100 genes, we can do it for maybe $250. And that are uh, the changes that we get uh, in the tumor can now be used for selection for targeted therapy because new targeted therapy will come out for diagnosis of resistance, for combination therapy, and for immunotherapy. So that's essentially the vision for all this work of identifying uh, changes in the DNA of melanoma. And uh, this is some, most of the members of the, what we call white spore, the white spore thing, the yellow spore thing. As I indicated, uh, we have very dedicated surgeon, Steve, Deepak, clinician, uh, Miguel, Matrin, Harriet, Mario, <coughs> Dale Han, also a surgeon, and Marcus, that provide us essentially with the specimen. Uh, and tell us in advance that they are coming. Uh, we have the bioinformatics that analyze the data. We have immunobiologists, which I didn't talk much about immunobiology uh, because of lack of time, but we have the Liping Chang is one of the major scientists that's involved in the PD-1 uh, treatment of melanoma, and we have TAP, uh, immunologists at Yale that are essentially working on this theme that the lymphocyte, the immune cells, essentially are attracted to the tumor based on the mutation that this tumor. So they are working uh, on that subject. And obviously we have the basic scientists that handle the pipette and do the work in the lab. Uh, we have the structural function art experts the Genome Center, and we have the funding from NIH, MRA, Gilad Science, Rose and Jeremy Meyer, those are our patient advocates, Dermatology Department, and Yale Cancer Center. Thank you.